Good evening and welcome to our winter Sunday night series, the backstage sessions at Signature Sounds. Among the things that we've missed this year are the backstage conversations between promoters and artists, DJs and artists, artists and artists. These nights are built on that great vibe and we're glad to welcome the audience backstage in a way to hear what we hear. Donations tonight go to the two artists and they help keep the lights on at Signature Sounds during this time. If you're broke, come for free. If you're a billionaire, donate a million. Those of us somewhere in between, whatever you can. We'll run info on that, uh, how to donate on the bottom of the screen as the night goes on. Tonight, we're thrilled to have Joe Pug and Courtney Hartman with us. We know Joe uh, first as an American touring musician who's always packing the house whenever he rolls into play at Signature Sounds. You might call this night a staff pick because we're all huge fans of his music, a singer-songwriter whose lyrics and sounds are influenced by Walt Whitman, Raymond Carver, John Hyatt, Beck, Cormac McCarthy. The way he got started, Joe dropped out of college and moved to Chicago, where he worked as a carpenter before breaking into the music scene. Since 2008, he's released a string of critically acclaimed EPs and albums, Nation of Heat, Messenger, The Great Despiser, Windfall, The Flood in Color. Paste Magazine wrote, unless your surname is Dylan, Waits, Ritter, or Prine, you could facepalm yourself to death trying to pen songs half as inspired. Joe is also the creator and host of The Working Songwriter, a monthly podcast with interviews of other great songwriters. And during 20 and 2020 and now into 2021, Joe has been hosting an amazing weekly live stream called Sunday Songs on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. There'll be a Sunday Songs tonight, as a matter of fact. We encourage you to listen to this conversation, then grab your beer or your coffee at a quick intermission and head over to his Sunday Songs to hear whatever he's bringing tonight. Go to joepugmusic.com and click on live stream to get to that show. And Joe has chosen for his guest, the musician and songwriter Courtney Hartman, which is thrilling to us. Most of us uh, at Signature Sounds heard Courtney, Courtney uh, play live for the first time on a night at the parlor room where she wrapped up a weekend of our back porch festival with one of those never to be got forgotten sets. Courtney and her fellow troubadour Robert Ellis were just off their record release Dear John, which was a tribute to John Hartford. They brought magic to that night that we will never forget. Uh, Courtney took up violin at age three, learning to play guitar at 11, wrote her first song at age 12. She spent much of her childhood immersed in the bluegrass world, a factor that eventually led her to a seven year stint in the Grammy nominated band Della May. During her time with Della May, she also released collaborative albums with Robert Ellis, that Dear John album I mentioned, uh, and another album with Taylor Ashton, who we also love, a 2018 Been On Your Side. This year, Courtney released her first solo debut, well, redundantly, her first solo debut album, Re uh, Ready Reckoner, which we love, much of which she wrote during and after a walking the Camino de, Sa de Santiago, a 500 mile pilgrimage route across Spain. The album was co-produced by Shahzad Ismaili, a composer and multi-instrumentalist known for his work with Lou Reed and Tom Waits. A number of her friends were on that, including the renowned guitarist Bill Frizzell. Courtney's based in Loveland, Colorado. Let's start by bringing Joe on screen. Hi, Joe. Hey, Lynn. Thanks for that lovely introduction. It was its probably the best introduction I've ever gotten from somebody. It felt like a, <laughs> like a well, eulogy or something. Oh, uh, a <laughs> eulogy. God forbid, Joe. I, um, I miss you. We all miss you so much. You were one of the last shows we had uh, before we all went on uh, went dark for this pandemic. Uh, so it's great to see you again in any way. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Of course, it. of course. Uh, so we asked all of the interviewers, uh, and many of them are artists, including you, and that's actually how we think of you most of all. But uh, we asked all of our guest hosts to describe or to choose a, a, an artist they wanted to interview. So how did you choose Courtney? Yeah, I believe I gave you a list of five people and she was at the top of it for sure. That was like my number one with a bullet. And that's uh, true. I was introduced to um, Courtney's music by that Dear John album that you're talking about uh, that she did with Robert Ellis. Robert's a friend of mine. We've toured a bunch before. I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, and so that's how she kind of came onto my radar uh, two or three years ago. And um, I think it, it's really, it's unusual enough to find like a really great instrumentalist uh, beyond that, it's very unusual to find a really great songwriter, but I think I've been around music long enough to know that the true unicorns in this creative world, like the 
the, the people that you just really don't see at all are the people who are amazing instrumentalists who can also craft a tune. And so um, that's what I consider her to be. And uh, I, I just relished the chance to pick her brain. That's amazing. Thanks, Joe. Uh, let's bring Courtney on screen. Hi. Hey there. Y'all both got me blushing already. You're so sweet. <laughs> well, uh, then we did our job because we love you. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to say welcome to Courtney and thanks, Joe, for making all this happen with us. And uh, Courtney, you're in, in Loveland, Colorado right now? I'm in uh, Wisconsin, actually. Oh. So that's a story to tell, but but from Loveland as of about a month ago before. Okay. That. Okay, great. And Joe, I think you're outside of D.C. probably. I am. Yeah, I'm in Maryland. I'm in between uh, Baltimore and D.C. Great. All right. Well, uh, it sounds like we're in for a great night. Thanks, you guys. And uh, once again, just want to remind everyone to stay tuned right after the show. Well, actually go to JoePugMusic.com for another hour of great music after this one. Um, have a blast, you two, and we'll see you uh, at the end. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. Hey, Courtney, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? You know, considering uh, uh, the state of the world the last year, I'm, I'm pretty good in the scheme of things. Yeah, good. You mentioned that you're in uh, Wisconsin. Where are you in Wisconsin? How'd you end up there? I'm in Eau Claire. Um, it's been uh, just a couple weeks now. It's been really, really brief. I, as Lynn mentioned, I'm from Loveland, Colorado, and I had been away for about 10 years, um, went to Boston and then New York and then went home for what felt like kind of a pilgrimage back home, figuring out what home meant, which transformed completely in the last year. And then um, my husband and I bought a place in Eau Claire a couple weeks ago. So I'm in our back laundry room. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it's brand new. I think um, I think everyone uh, feels great when they buy a house uh, uh, for the first time, but I think particularly for musicians. I know for me and my wife, mm -hmm. It was a real big deal when we bought a place because you really feel like as long as I pay this number uh, yeah. every month for the next 30 years, they can't kick me out of this damn place no matter what yeah. they do. Yeah. And just already in a couple of weeks settling in a little bit, it's nice to go to the same place for coffee every morning. Exactly. Yeah. How did you and your husband decide on Eau Claire? Is he from there or just dug the place? He's He's from Wisconsin, from Madison, um, and went to school up here, and we met through mutual musician friends. Um, and I had spent a good amount of time in Eau Claire working with some other folks up here. Um, Shane Leonard is a fantastic producer and drummer, and we had met through a camp called Miles of Music. And he had me up here a number of times, and at that point I fell in love with it, but I felt like you had to kind of be from Wisconsin to live here or something. <laughs> so then I ended up married and marrying a Wisconsinite, and now I'm here. <laughs> yes, honorary status for you there. Yeah. Huh? That's great, man. That, well, that's yeah. excellent. Congratulations on, on buying the home. Thank uh, you. I want to talk a little bit tonight about, um, you know, it's interesting, the music that you're steeped in the most, I would say, is, is uh, bluegrass. And uh, to, to kind of come up in that as a kid, given what the general culture is in in America and, and what the popular culture is, it's kind of countercultural uh, of a thing to be interested in and and to to take up. How did you end up taking up that type of music and, and what did music look like in your household growing up? Um, so I grew up in a big family. I have nine siblings and oh, wow. we were also homeschooled and my parents wanted us to be into something that we could be into together. So music became that thing. Um, and they had friends who played bluegrass and went to festivals, so I think they took me to my first festival when I was two. And uh, we took violin lessons, did Suzuki when we were little. Um, but music at home, it was just a part of every day. It was part of, um, we had practiced every day. We had to, that was just a part of growing up. Mm. And then playing together was a big part of um, growing up with my siblings. And maybe there were times where it was something we had to do, but I think um, it was for our best. It was they had the, our best interests in mind, and I, I think I fell in love with guitar because it was the instrument I didn't have to practice. Of course, it was the one I could do if I wanted to. Standard. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I I got little kids, and so I'm kind of interested in 
uh, the Suzuki method, it sounds like, you know, for you, maybe it was the thing that you had to do. And sometimes it was kind of a bummer. Do you, are you glad that you did that when you were younger? Or do you wish you came to music later? I am glad. Um, the, I think the magic of the Suzuki method is, is just the way that they structured around ear training. Um, so I know that that affected me a lot because I still, when I'm hearing stuff, I'm a pretty awful fiddle player now, mm -hmm. but I will still um, hear stuff on the, on the fingerboard, um, on the fiddle and not always the guitar. So I know that those, those early years were so effective as far as influencing what we can absorb musically. What is ear training and how does it differ from other methods of learning music and, mm -hmm. and what advantages does it have? Um, so ear training, that's a great question. In, re in that regard specifically is, I think um, they would teach kids how to listen for the correct notes instead of looking at a page. Um, ear training for me now, I usually think of it as um, also involving the relationship of notes. So un so being able to hear how, how far notes are from each other mm. and not in a real like theory sense, but just in a spatial sense. Um, and, and then being able to sing that I think is really huge. Got it. So it's, it's not so much like having perfect pitch. You hear something and you know, it's an F sharp. It's more in relation. Like that's a one, that's a four, that's a five. Type yeah, of yeah, 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 totally. Or that's just a whole step or that's a half step. Um, but I don't have anything close to perfect pitch. So uh, I'm, I'm a delinquent there. <laughs> I remember one time, uh, it, you know, I was mentioning earlier, I first found out about your music uh, when you made that record with my friend Robert Ellis. And I was on tour with him once and I was explaining to him that I, I came to music later in life and, and I yeah. can't hear any of that stuff. And I think he was a few beers in at that point. And he was, I just remember standing on a balcony with him and him like singing to me and be like, you can't hear the difference between this and this. He was furious at me. <laughs> that sounds like a classic Robert moment. <laughs> classic Robert. He gets worked up. He does get worked up. I love him so much. And he's a deeply inspiring person to me. The way that yep. he is willing to just like delve like really, really deep into something, whether that's yep. getting into Randy Newman or getting into a certain scale or progression, whatever. Yeah, Robert is, he is what I always imagined an artist to be when I was a kid. You know what I mean? Like, and you get older and you meet artists and they have different ways of doing things. And, you know, there's more than one way to, to skin a cat, but he really, um, the way that he gets so passionate about a specific thing and then just dives in deep, uh, and it kind of has like a monomania about it. Like that to me when I was a kid, I thought that's what all artists were at, at all times. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. I think I am a little bit, uh, I'm a bit of a kid when it comes to like getting distracted and easily excited about new things. Yeah. Um, so having the longevity to really get deep right. isn't always something that comes easy for me. I feel that. So if music was kind of just a part of the water for you guys as, as you were growing up um, mm -hmm. with your family, at what point did you realize, because I'm, I'm assuming that all the rest of your nine brothers and sisters are not necessarily all uh, professional musicians, mm -hmm. at what point did you realize that this might be something different for you and that, that it was a, a bit more serious than just a, a childhood pastime? I, there was a part of me that um, never really imagined anything different. Oh, okay. um, You know, I loved, loved being outside and I loved herbs and natural medicine. And there was times in high school where like I could go that direction or, you know, whatever. But as a kid, I just didn't imagine being anything different. Um, hmm. So I, either I was a little close minded there or I just like had had this like this is what I do. This is this is part of who I am. And of course, like so many, so many times, like it's just like a wave. And I think maybe especially as I'm as I've been in it a little bit longer and, and doing more of my own thing now, there's a lot of questions, um, especially around this year where you're you question um not your value as an artist, but if that is only a piece of you that you see, and if there's other parts of you that you need to allow to be seen. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, it is a part of me. Um, 
I hope I can do it for as long as it brings me joy or as long as, you know, it feels right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think maybe uh, your your ability from a very early age to conceptualize yourself playing music into the future, that might have to do with mm. the scene that you were around, which again, those bluegrass festivals are kind of countercultural. You could see working musicians um, mm -hmm. who were, you know, like when I grew up, I, I was really just into popular culture. So my first concert was going to see like the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Silverchair at an arena. Yeah. And yeah. when you're a, a kid, like there's no way to be like, okay, I'm here playing the guitar in my basement and I'll get there. That it just yeah. seems like magic. But going to these festivals, it seems to me like that was a really cool opportunity to give you as a kid because that seems... Not that it's easy, but it seems a lot more approachable than than the kind of more show businessy aspects of of it. Yeah, I was um, just thinking the other day, like the immense value that the festival scene has in that community, and you know, it's there's plenty of music festivals that are awesome, but they are they are just for um, observers essentially. They're to go and be entertained and enjoy and commune with people all yeah. beautiful things. Um, but what I experience and so many young people have experienced over the years through acoustic music festivals or folk or whatever, wherever you play as a participant, um, it is, you're right, it's like you can see this, this, this little um, kind of link that can get you from one place to the next as these people right. are reaching down and encouraging and kind of helping to build something within you. Can you think of a time in particular at one of those festivals where in the moment you thought to yourself, wow, this is this is really special. I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life. The first um, moment that comes to mind was at Winfield um, Festival. That was the Walnut Valley Festival is in Kansas in the middle of nowhere. A lot of people and I was I was probably 14 or 15 um, and I had had Brian Sutton's DVDs for a year or so. DVDs, wow. Was a big fan. You're uh, really dating yourself with the DVD reference there, Courtney. I Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I just, um, he was a big hero of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd met him a couple times, but he was picking tunes with somebody and I went and was like, can I play with y'all? And just, they were just so welcoming. And I just thought I had, I, I had made it in my mind. That's I was really there. Neat. I was so psyched. Can you play a tune for us now that you think would be really uh, uh, representative of, of what you were learning and playing at that time? Like if there was only mm. one tune that you took away from your time very early on at those festivals, um, what you think for you would be the most iconic? Yeah, um, there is like one specific song which came to mind recently with the passing of Tony Rice. Yeah. Um, and he was his album with Norman Blake was like one of the early albums that was had a huge influence on me and I was probably about that same age maybe a little younger and I had a melody line from the chorus of this tune stuck in my head and I couldn't figure out what it was from and it's like we, you know there was I couldn't look on Spotify right. or whatever when I found that it was off that record I just got so excited yeah and I don't know um, I don't know what it was. I still don't know what it was that I fell in love with exactly other than all the reasons you fall in love with that music. Right. But as a 12 year old to feel like I, like these words really meant a lot to me, but, um, it's a tune called Ridge Road Gravel that I've sang for a long time. Um, let's see. And I just have to find... Where the heck that pick went? There it is. Um, yeah, so I'll play this one. But um, I do have a, a clear memory of playing this one with my sister, Rachel, and we, um, we were going through some family, some tough family stuff, and we were at a festival, and we just looked at each other while we were singing this tune, and I think both of us were just crying and just felt so held by that community at that time um so it's not a it's not a sad sad tune but yeah i got you Coming down, 
What a song. I love that one. I can really hear in your playing, obviously you have such a distinctive style of your own, but I can hear a ton of uh, Norman Blake in what you're doing. And mm. I, I just love that. I, One of my, as a guy who mainly just writes songs, like one of my hobbies is I try to, I try to play guitar the way that you're doing it there, but it's just kind of like a just kind of like a personal thing because you can't make it sound like Norman Blake ever. Oh my gosh, yeah. And, um, but, but you... How long did it take for you to get that? Um, it's not a syncopation that, that's going on there, but there's just in his plane and also in your plane, there's just such a fluency and, and just such a buoyancy that just isn't. It's not just right on. Like mm. if I practice a lot, I can just make it just go right on the numbers. And yet you can make it really make a melody really bounce and sing. How long did it take you to get to a place where you could do that? Or do you just always remember being able to play like that? Um. I still, thank you, I still think I'm learning how to do that. Um, it's like, a, there was, I know that there was a season where I worked on a few particular things a lot. Um, Clarence White, um, I, I listened to, to a lot of his playing for a while, and he was doing, um, he would do a lot of like up, kind of upbeat um, bass runs. <laughs> Um, where you're doing, you're just grabbing low strings with an upstroke. That's all that it is. Okay. So working on um, a lot of what I worked on, especially like as a teenager, was um, being able to play really fluidly um, on all of the strings. So it was just a very like physical, technical thing. Um, but you're right. This like to hear. To hear Norman Blake play and Tony Rice play, and they play together, and they both play with such a specific groove. Yes. It blows my mind. I remember, um, have you, I'm sure you have because you're a fan of his, but uh, I, the Norman Blake album that I first got turned on to, I don't know how I got turned on to it, was his Live at McCabe's album. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a version of Arkansas Traveler on there that I, I just really love. And I, I tried to play it a bunch, and in my mind, it was super fast what he was mm -hmm. doing. And then I finally went back and listened to the album again. It's not fast. Oh, I mean, it mm -hmm. is, but it, it wasn't as fast as I remembered it being. It was just this buoyancy. There was just a life to it uh, that he was playing with, such such a voice. I had a, that's kind of a similar experience with that exact tune where I went back and heard it. And I was like, it's a lot. It sips back a lot more than I think it does. And it, yeah, there's magic in that. There's magic in that for, for sure. So those were your early years uh, and mm -hmm. formative experiences. And then I would have to imagine your next very formative experience, you ended up going to study music at, at Berkeley College of Music, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you end up deciding on that? And, and how did the actual um, experience of it jive with what your expectations were? Hmm. I, um, it was the only school I applied to actually, or finished <laughs> my enough. application to. <laughs> And I went out there and, you know, I was 
there was I was paying my way through college and trying to figure that out. Um, but I went and ended up getting enough scholarship to go for a couple years, and then when I didn't have enough money, I stopped going. Um, but I was also touring at that time and wasn't really around much, so mm. they kind of said you got to either be here or not. So I. I, I said not at the so time. You said peace. <laughs> yeah. um, is that when you were touring but, uh, with Delamay or or with other? Yeah, groups? that okay. was early, early, early Delamay stuff. Was I was still in school, um, but I think Berkeley has such a a wide range of ex, I mean experiences for people. I think I was really I know I was really lucky to be taken kind of under the wing. Most, um, most particularly, um, John McGann was a big influence, and he helped head up the American Roots Department there. But there were a lot of folks that poured into me, and I, I, I um, I'm grateful for that. And then there was lots of, I'm sure, wasted time and this and that and whatever. Yeah. Um, but it, it was a good thing for for a time. I dropped out of college as well, and I know exactly what you mean. I, I don't regret the time that I spent there, but right. I'm sure as hell glad that I, I left when I did because it was my time to go, and I've yeah. never had to show anybody a, a piece of paper on the wall to uh, yeah. to get where I was going. Were um, you going for music? I was going for playwriting. Uh, wow. Yeah, I had cool. a. I played music when I was younger, and then I had um, I had this teacher in high school um, who a guy named Bob Garman, very amazing theater teacher. And I got really into to theater and acting. And so I ended up going to college for it. Now, I don't think I would have ended up, ended up going for that if it hadn't been for this teacher, because I right. think music is where I was always going to end up. But, uh, but yeah, I went for playwriting and um, I just got to a certain point where I just didn't want to be in a classroom. I wanted to be like a working artist, like as mm. soon as possible. And you know, like you said, you were working your way through school. So I was kind of, I was the same way once I got out of school. Um, I was just like, well, I, I know how to go and make enough money to pay for a room and a house. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So let me just go mm -hmm. do that and, and do this at night. And it, it, not for everybody. And if there's younger people watching this who totally. are in school right now, like I'm not telling you to go drop out. But if you have an inkling to do it, like it's not necessarily the wrong thing to do. I don't think. Yeah, especially now. There's a lot of ways to learn a lot. They really are. I, I don't know what colleges are going to do, frankly, because, right. I mean, there's so much information. I mean, besides getting a credential, if you need a credential, there's only one way to get that, right? But mm -hmm. if what you want to do is just make art that is compelling to other people, I mean, all the information that you need for that, that is not under lock and key anymore. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a big part of um, one of my main regrets with school was that I didn't, like, learn engineering while I was there. Uh, um, not necessarily go for the full thing, but I was like, ah, oh, why didn't I get the licenses and take care of the tutoring or whatever? Um, I know. But YouTube has been great. <laughs> I use YouTube for engineering all the time. My, yeah. my workflow for learning how to record myself is I just work until there's a problem, yep. and then I YouTube the problem, and then I go back and I work until there's a problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I don't know who the good teachers are or anything, because I just am like, I just want to figure out what I've what I'm doing wrong. But I know, and there's plenty, <laughs> there's plenty I'm doing wrong. But uh -huh. <laughs> yes. YouTube will teach me not to. Uh, so how did you end up hooked up with with Della May? How did that process happen, and and what did those early tours look like? Um. The, so Della May. They were all based in Boston at the time. Um, met them through, I met Kimber through um, mutual friends and started touring with them. And it was, um, yeah, golly. I think our first tour um, was in Germany, um, like three weeks. We had a bunch of shows. We hadn't learned how many days we really wanted to play in a row yet. So we played 18 shows in 18 days. And... Wow. It was great. It, we had we really had a blast and um, did a bunch of touring in the states and then did a bunch of abroad touring um, mm. through the State Department mostly, um, and they were very formative years. What do you mean through the State Department? We were um, working with the State Department. We'd be sent over to countries that typically it was countries that they wanted to improve relationships with. 
Um, so we would go as American diplomats, essentially, musical diplomats, and go and work. Um, it was such a wide range of work that we'd do, but um, a lot of it kind of was structured around teaching, and because Delamay is all women, we were there were doors that were open to us that they couldn't necessarily open to other bands. So we did a lot of work with women. Um, and then in every place we went, we did a collaboration with a local artist. Um, they'd learn some of our stuff, we'd learn some of theirs, and then a performance of some sort. So it was, it, those were incredible, incredible trips. So they sent you guys to nations that we wanted better relations with and nations we were at war with, they sent Limp Biscuit. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, that, that's a really cool program, and that had to be pretty uh, heady stuff for you. I mean, had you traveled internationally before that, or, or a, little bit, a little bit, a little bit, okay. and we had played in Europe, but you know, going to um, Central Asia and the Middle East and places that, you know, it's just that's a whole different experience, and and very specifically being put into situations where you're seeing a real wide range of what that um, culture is. Mm. Um, yeah, th it, was, it, it was really, in really influential on like, what, me. What is one of the personal, not musical, but personal lessons you took away from, from those experiences in particular? Mm. Um, so as I was packing up um, the barn I lived in in Loveland a couple weeks ago, I found in my little treasure box this purple barrette that I've kept for eight years or so. And um, it kind of like is, embodies this experience. But we were playing a, a very, uh, in a small village, um, in, a, in a essentially like a um, home for um, disability, kids with disabilities and Down syndrome kids who had been pretty outcast. And it was just... It was awful. The, the conditions were so awful, and it was freezing cold, and these kids just had nothing, and um, it, then the society had kind of cast them out. But they loved to dance, and they loved to sing, and we just spent a whole afternoon just hanging with them in this big, cold, kind of concrete space, and um, they were such a joy, and clearly there was no, you know, we couldn't talk to them really um, because of a language barrier, but I'll never forget, it was such an impactful moment, this little girl who I'd been dancing with, or what, you know, she was playing my guitar, and she came up as we were leaving, and had, she had a single barrette in her hair, and she took it out of her hair, and she put it in my hair. And um, it just, even now, as I was looking at it the other day, it just, for me, was like, um, we, there's, she just gave me the thing that she felt was the most beautiful of hers, and that was... It was so impactful, and and wanting to live up to that example, I guess, was the lesson I learned there, um, just in giving of ourselves, whether that's through our art or through our family or our community. Can you play me a song that you think is most, when you think back to that Della May phase, uh, mm. can you play me a song that um, is the first one to come in mind, come to mind that you think is most representative of that time that you're you're most proud of? Well, um, well, to be totally honest, I haven't played those song those songs in a while, but That's I could no um, I could play you a song that some songs that I've written or a song um, that I wrote shortly after leaving as I was kind That's of perfect. processing that yeah, yeah. Um, change is not a real it's not something I'm like good at, I guess. <laughs> well, um, not many people are. It's, it's we're a lot, <laughs> we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy making sure things don't change. Um, so. so let's see. This was um, what I'm going to play you a tune that actually I haven't released yet. But after it's been about seven years with the girls, um, I uh, moved home basically changed up everything. I left New York and I moved home to Colorado and I just lived in a Winnebago trailer that was parked outside, outside of my um, family's house. And that was a weird time. Yeah, kind of living in a, in a van down by the river, huh? Yeah, exactly. 
It was, except for the river being our like concrete hole of a swimming pool that's been mostly just filled with like salamanders and swamp water. Okay, so it, it would have been an upgrade to be living in a Van Damme. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was a that was a strange time of of getting to needing to kind of figure out who the heck I was, who I was in relation to my family and, and to the world and what my music was and feeling very alone. And um, especially, I think, after traveling with a group of, of very dear people for so long. Um, and I think it's after any sort of a parting or breakup, you can't help but think back on um, those particular memories that only you share together, mm. and and it's neither uh, it's neither like mourning them or celebrating them, but it's just kind of being like, oh yeah, those were there too. Mm. Um, let me know. Okay, so um, this one's called Wandering. I haven't put it out yet, but. It is recorded. <laughs> Your generous heart changed me Listening to the songs you sang about loving Imperfectly, but loving just the same Singing, we can make a life of being free, and we can make a life of you and me, and we can make a life of wandering, and the wandering doesn't have to happen alone. Oh, I had begun to lose my hope, feeling like I was gonna choke, and thinking life was a cruel joke. I want to think a better way That we can make a life of being free And we can make a life of you and me And we can make a life of wandering And the wandering doesn't have to happen alone Signature sounds Sunday night world premiere. I'm sure your your management and team are going to be thrilled with that. Um, I am my management, so okay, it's, I'm enough. thrilled. <laughs> it's a beautiful song. You know, I, I was you. mentioning to Lynn earlier what I think is so unique about you. Uh, it's very rare that you find someone who is a, a world class instrumentalist who can write world class uh, songs. When did songwriting become a part of your um, uh, repertoire was it was it early on or, or was that something that came later for you um, early on 
kind of. When I was like 12, I started writing a couple oh, songs. Very and early. Yeah. Um, they were really heartfelt about, you know, um, love and things like that um, at 12 years old or whatever. And uh, I kept writing, but I got really in guitar, into guitar for a couple years, and so that was kind of my thing. And I've never been, um, singing hasn't, hasn't been a thing that I've felt comfortable with, um, and it was never something that... Um, came easy or felt like it, you know, I was told growing up, like, you're good at guitar, like, do guitar. And I right. think that made a big impact on me. Um, and so I just worked less on singing. But I, I do love singing, and I'm just a little less comfortable with it. Mm. Um, but, yeah, so I wrote songs, and then that was a part of my time with Delamay, was writing material for the band. And then I had this pile of songs that didn't fit anywhere else, and so that's basically what I did, how I made a solo record was those songs. And have you had it, you haven't had a chance to tour on this yet, right? This solo record? Um, I have some, this was like, um, it came out some before last. So I did okay, do a so bit, but was yeah. planning on quite a bit last year. I'll bet. I'll bet. Alas. Uh, alas. Well, well, we'll be back soon enough. The, the vaccine's on the horizon. So. Yeah. Um, well, before I let you go here, I'd love to hear you play, um, uh, if you haven't played it already, the, the song that you're most proud of, the song that if you had to, to play your way through the pearly gates with a single song, um, the one that you would, that you'd pull out, that, that you love the most. Um, let's see. I can do that. Um, right. I, I was curious, are, are we going to get to hear a song from you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I could, we had, well, we got... I got about five minutes uh, to go here, so I, I'd love to hear. I don't know. I feel like we're on a roll, okay. uh, getting to hear so much of your music, and and I'm I'm. If it's cool with you, I, I'd love to hear you play uh, the okay. one that you love the most. Well, let me. Um, I'll play a tune because it's January and. Yeah. We're all making or not making news resolutions. I did not this year. <laughs> well, that means you might actually get something done. If you yeah, exactly. Commit to it. Um. So here's this one. Um, making there we go. Making soft resolutions at the end of December to walk a little slower and try to talk. If I'm particularly ambitious, I'll wake before the sun goes. And we'll cook more together and try not to ever fall asleep with the light switch on. Oh, in January 1st, I'll be here ready or not. I can be too careful, you can be too kind I can be too sorry, you can be too right And we can be too Over and over and over again Be 
Because January 1st will be here, we'll make it or not. In one way or another, I love you more than I thought. Oh, more than I thought. Oh, more than I thought. Oh, man. Man, that's one of those songs that you feel like you've heard a million times the first time that you hear it I say as a listener that's <laughs> thank that, you that one seems like it uh, i don't know how you felt writing it maybe it was really uh difficult but sometimes songs like that 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 are really that have their own feel to them you, you feel like they're always just sitting out there in the ether and all you did is you just took it off the shelf and you just brought it into reality yeah that's a good feeling well, maybe a once in a life feeling yeah yeah well i'm trying to figure out how to make it a much more often feeling but uh yeah i think the only way to do that on a really regular basis is to just get deeply into heroin so i'm gonna <laughs> i I'll thought just... i was about to get a big like daily piece of advice for you from well, you. No, i mean i think i think that that would work but it has yeah. its, its drawbacks as well as, as <laughs> from, from the 20th century um an artist well um, hey, thank you so much for sitting down and, and tell me, telling me about your journey so far. And I just can't wait to see what you do next. I think uh, um, it's going to be, uh, there's a lot of us out here who are just um, uh, just feeling really lucky that we get to watch you um, learn and play and write and sing over the years to come. Thank you. That means a lot to hear. I was thrilled, just absolutely thrilled to get to chat with you and to see your name come up in Lynn's email. Um, Same yeah. here. Well, yeah. I think when COVID's done, hopefully uh, I'll be touring through uh, Eau Claire or, or you'll be touring yeah. through uh, uh, DC and, and we'll, we'll have a beer somewhere and, and yeah. hang out. Sit backstage somewhere for real. For real, for real. Out of yeah. the laundry room. <laughs> not, yeah, not, not have to do a, a sound check uh, yeah, exactly. uh, before uh, talking yeah. backstage. So. Yeah, what a treat. Thank you. Treat for me too. Thanks, Courtney.